Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm delighted and privileged to be here with you. And I have a problem, though. I really can't talk to you because I don't know you. And my first slide just outlines that. Um, I don't know you, so I can't coach you. It was something that a great athlete once said to us. I think we were about 10 and 11 years of age in the Annie Carty Parish Hall down in County Tipperary. Annie Carty is just beside where I come from, Kappa White, and it's a, a fantastic reservoir of, 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 of athletes, not just Gaelic players. But Macdonald Bailey appeared there in 1971 to give us our first coaching experience. And when he entered the room, we were in awe of him because he was a world record holder, an ex-world record holder in the 100 meters. He was a man that had won an Olympic medal, albeit at the Helsinki Olympics. Some of us here will remember, no, I don't see anybody who could remember Helsinki 1952. However, my point is, is that he pitched up and wanted and was giving us a coaching session. But we were all bitterly disappointed when he said, I don't know you, I can't coach you. So what we did for the rest of the day, we played games. And through games, he got to know us. And at the end, he says, you're a fantastic bunch of young athletes, and you really will have great sport and enjoyment in sport. I'll come back again and help coach you. His first day was spent doing what we all should do, really, getting to know us, getting, getting us involved in activities that are playful. And that was my first coaching lesson. Years later, it did come back to help me understand what we talked about when we, met, when we talk about long-term coach development. So, to help us make some sense out of this, here's my coaching tip. Here's my coaching tip for you. Who are you? Who are you? And do you know who your athlete is? Do you know who your player is? So who are you is a very fundamental start. It starts with the value of wanting to get to know somebody. And so that's what I would suggest is my, my tip of the day, getting to know who your player is. I need to get to know you here. And if I wore my hat as a strength and conditioning coach, I'd have you all out here now on the corridor, and we'd be doing some tests. But looking at some of you, I'd prefer to stay here and do the test in here. So the test is very simple. I want you to put your left hand up in front of you, just as you see on the screen. Now, for those of you who are married, you'll know where your ring finger is. For the rest of you, your ring finger is your fourth digit. If you count from your thumb, it's the fourth across. Have a look at it. Just have a good look at it. Is it longer than your second digit? Is it longer than your second finger? If it's longer, will you stand up? Don't be shy. It's OK. Just stand up. Yeah. Oh, all right. My mathematical brain tells me that's about 75% of the audience. Thank you very much. Sit down. Thank you. You've just confirmed what we find out in sports science that those with a longer fourth digit are more aggressive, are faster, tend to be more anaerobic, and perform team sports. So if you've had that longer finger, you fall into that category. However, the bad news is you're prone to eczema and dandruff. <laughs> That's what science tells us. And by the way, those of you who don't have a longer fourth finger, you're the real decision makers. You're the guys that will actually see stuff happening that the longer fourth finger digit athlete will barge through. You'll see the opportunities. So look, the great thing is, the great thing is that science tells us about this, and we've actually shown the top players in team sports around the world, actually the majority of them have longer fourth digit ratios. However, when it comes to the decision makers, they don't tend to have that longer fourth finger. This is used as a talent identification tool, by the way, in sports such as downhill skiing, slalom, rowing, and um, it was used in football in the 1990s in Italy to identify 
potential talent. I'm not saying that you should all rush out now and check all your players' fingers, because remember, you could get it horribly wrong. If only it were so easy for us as coaches. If only it were so easy. I wish it were, but the decades that I've been involved in sport, I came across this in the 1990s, and I thought I'd fallen on the secret. But it ain't that easy, and you know it's not that easy. At the heart of all of this, regardless of your finger length, is communication. We're trying to communicate here in a two-way fashion, but I don't envy you. Because out there in the world in which we live, I just placed my iPhone on my uh, bag there because I forgot it was in my pocket. So I have the means to communicate, to engage with my, my good wife and my family, and, but my, my athletes, everybody, I have the means. It, we have means now and systems and technologies that we never had before. That we never ever had before. There is no excuse for me not to call my wife this morning. Some of you have done that. Ten years ago, you wouldn't because you had an excuse not to. You didn't have your iPhone. Well, 15 years ago, maybe. But look, here's what's happening. When you take a club, I have this information reliably from a good colleague of mine, Damien Young, so please blame Damien if the figures aren't right. So here it is. If you're in a club, and you're coaching a youth athlete or a player. I tend to call all players athletes. So forgive me if, if I drift between athlete and player this morning. So you're in the middle of this communication circuit. The young player is playing school hurling. The young player is playing perhaps school football. And you're a football coach. And club hurling at maybe a senior level. And maybe, as some do, another sport, another code. Well, that communication system, which is ultimately your responsibility to ensure it's in place, really is a small network of, 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 of communication. It's a small network. In other words, maybe there's four key stakeholders in it. However, as an inter-county coach, the challenges are far greater. Because with the 20-odd or 30-odd players on the squad, Damien reliably informs me that there could be an average of 8 to 15 other coaches involved in those players' lives. Now, that's our challenge. I work a good deal in pro sport, and no such challenge exists in pro sport. So, GA, the games of GA present unique challenges that don't exist in other sports. So, my view is that you have to deal with this yourself. But the dealing of it is based on maybe not, maybe, maybe it is. Maybe it is a communication system that involves that iPhone, WhatsApp, or whatever. The challenge is there for you, though, because it's one of the big challenges in all sports. It's made easier in pro, pro sport. It's very challenging for you because of the diversity and the range of stakeholders that are involved. Over the next minute, I want you to reflect on the actual fundamental types of activity that go on in the environment, that go on within the segments of the video that we will show you shortly. And I want you to look at it from a very raw, basic, fundamental point of view. And I want to see if, if we can tease out the types of activities that are being displayed in these segments of the video. Aaron, would you play the video, please?
Ladies and gentlemen, I, I'm only assuming now, and this is dangerous, that what we've just seen probably represents what we think our games of hurling and football are. And would I be right in saying that they represent the fundamental activities of the games, those video clips? I kind of, any nodding of anybody like to nod or? Yes, well let's take it that yes, they represent the fundamental activities, the raw core activities that make these games so exciting. Well, how would you analyze what has just taken place? You would probably call Damien Young and say, Damien, I need you to analyze this. And I need you to give me the metrics on the movement patterns, the time motion analysis, etc. And later on, he'll present some wonderful information on those key metrics of what's going on there. But I want to lift the lid a little bit more and ask you to look deeper down into those games, into those segments, and see if you see the following. The fundamental activities that are taking place there can be summed up on this matrix. Here's a matrix that goes from ordered to chaos. Where would you place hurling on a continuum of order to chaos? Remembering now that American football and rugby union is a pretty ordered game. Remembering that golf is pretty ordered, it starts here, you just got to get the ball to there, nobody's going to shoulder you on the way down as you move towards the first bunker, nobody's going to throw you a wobbler, okay? So we place golf G, rugby union on the continuum of being reasonably predictable. Where do we find football and hurling? Would it be true to say on the chaotic end of the continuum? Okay, I'll assume that we can agree on that, but I'd love an argument on it at some stage. Now, if we move on to the other elements, the fundamentals, is the game steady or dynamic? Well, if the, those games are steady, well, we know that they're not steady, so I think we'll, we, we, we'll agree on that. Physically comfortable? I have never, ever seen a physically comfortable hurling game or football game. They're physically stressful because that's the nature of them. What about mentally comfortable? Certainly not. P part of the caption showed the distraught, the stress, and the range of emotion that goes on, even on the field. What about controlled? Well, there are controlled moments. They are predictable moments. Yes, they are. But the games are punctuated with these terrifically uncontrolled movement bouts. From an, uh, an analysis we did many years ago, there are over 1,000 unrepeated bouts of activity in any given hurling match, if it's played for 70 plus minutes. So that means that the predictability is very, very low on the scale. However, ask ourselves, are we as coaches slaves to order and routine? Are we, are we, we are very good at devising drills. I think coaches are very good and very knowledgeable at devising drills that serve to order and organize. My coaching, my coaching challenge to you is, well, if that's all it is, if it's ordered and routined and drill related, well, it's not matching the chaos of the uncontrollable or the unpredictability of what actually goes on in the field of play. So when it comes to our coaching practice, here is something that you might think of. Is it worthwhile to think of bringing chaos and less predictability into drill-related activities. Are there opportunities for doing that? We can't go through that as a practical workshop here, but I'm sure coaches involved can see the point of that coaching message. So the coaching tip here is, and this I've borrowed from www.joe.ie, and I've seen it, and it's terrific stuff. It's actually excellent. The message being, as coaches, we need to be creative. So on the one hand, when we look at information that we get from workload and we want players and our, and our players to, be, to, have, to demonstrate great workload, here is a fact, and this is from Wisby and his colleagues over three years down in Australia, and it's Australian rules related. It may, it may be 
it may be something that we might take on board. And the fact is that their data shows that the teams that finish at the bottom of the league table work the hardest. Okay. So maybe bringing in a little bit of unpredictability and chaos to become more efficient and less predictable might help us in coaching these massively open chaotic sports that we deal in. What I'm not saying is that you don't focus on the fitness conditioning. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that everything should be in more balance when we actually assess the fundamental demands and requirements and needs of our sports. OK. So my challenge to you, and I would not like to leave without a challenge, is to ask you, have we as coaches developed the skills to be effective in coaching creatively, in coaching and managing chaos, and in coaching and managing unpredictability? I leave you with that rhetorical question. Which leads me to jump and lift the lid a little bit on effective coaching to a, a conclusion that probably would take a lot longer than the short 40 minutes that we have here today. Coaching is not just about what happens superficially, as you see somebody running five meters acceleration, deceleration. That's very important to understand. But there's a more deep-rooted set of activities going on on the field of play. But it is also, as your president very accurately noted, coaching is the effectiveness of social, cultural, and human interactions. Because to deal with chaos, to deal with unpredictability, we have to be very well endowed with a value system and behaviors to be able to deal with that. One eminent author in coaching called this a very messy reality of behaviors. So if we were to assume for a moment and come into the world of assuming that coaching is a very messy world of behaviors, we need something to guide us and help us through that. I want to share with you what we've done over the last 15 years with coaches that we, we certainly call successful from a range of sports. Now these sports are, we've extracted only the team sports because we felt that these were more appropriate for us as, as team coaches. And these are, these, are, these are coaches that come from both professional, semi-professional, amateur, at schools and college levels around the world in team sports. So 10 sports are represented across 11 countries. And we have, we have, we've worked with over 34 coaches from that population. And what we wound up doing was placing coaches into two groups, a growth group and a fixed group. Now, we won't get bogged down on the terms for the moment, but let me just try and explain what the growth and the fixed group look like. So the growth group were very similarly aligned to that very nice educational, psychological uh, uh, approach that Cal Dweck from Stanford University outlined in the mid-2000s. And we were already looking at this type of coach back in the 1990s, and you could see the trends and the tendencies of these coaches. The growth coach has a mindset that goes like this. He or she, I can change as a coach. Failure is an actual opportunity. Now, this might seem like a platitude or, a, or a, a, just a thrown about statement. But it certainly has meaning when we look at the practices and traits of very successful coaches. Failure is an actual opportunity. And the other key factor about a growth mindset coach is that they can actually deliver strategies. They can actually deliver techniques, practical techniques and strategies to help make change. And that's a big difference compared to the fixed mindset coach who sees limitations in themselves and in their players, who pigeonholes players, but who has a very strong focus on winning. And that seems to drive them just the winning. Winning is the only goal in their mindset. They also have that, that they're either good at it or not so good at it. They, so there's an interesting mindset that goes on. We were able to categorize or place coaches, sorry, into those two categories. And we have looked at it 
as well in terms of the common traits between those two groups. And here are some of the common traits. They have a comparable win-loss ratio, but the growth mindset coach tends to display a greater win ratio. And we look at that at the moment. Both types of coaches survive in sport. They survive. They get by. They exist in sport. They're all organized, passionate, highly knowledgeable, and resilient. Resilient in the sense that they stay in the game. So the two types of coaches share a lot of common traits. I mentioned the winning ratio. Those with a growth mindset have that little advantage in terms of a win ratio. Typically, they are 64% success win related in terms of the profile. Do you know what one of the highest win ratios is in Gaelic games? Okay, well let, let, me, let me explain it like this. You know the way uh, Michael Jordan played over 1,200 basketball games in the NBA over his 15 year career? 1,250 yard games. His win ratio was 65%. In other words, 6 out of 10 games he won. Okay, Tiger Woods in his best years, the 15 years of his best years, had a win ratio of just about 30%. So he won 3 out of 10. On his best 15 years, Henry Shefflin in his best 15 years had a win ratio of 82%. Okay, anyway, that's a little aside. Coaches in team sports have a far better ratio than coaches in individual sports. Okay, so when we say 65 for these growth coaches, it's a damn good win ratio. So they are doing something to give them an advantage over the fixed mindset coach in terms of even winning, even though they're not focused on winning. It just so happens that they are winning more though. So we were very interested in this and when we got back to look at the data and look at the information through interview, through working with them, through survey, and doing the same with their players, here's some of our findings and I want to share that with you. Because interestingly, what they're doing is doing something that you have an opportunity and that the GAA currently are doing, is to dig down deep and understand what's happening, what's influencing their behaviors. So we'll just share the, the we we'll share this with you. Here, but here's an example. The fixed coach, just to get into your mindset, what does the fixed coach do? And I want to ask you, which side are you on? Are you fixed? Or are you growth and more creating in your approach to coaching? So if I could guide you through this over the next 10 minutes, we'll be nearly there. The fixed coach transfers his values, this is what we saw, to the player through behavior. So everything we do is behavior, isn't it? But what we're actually doing, we're seeing with the fixed coach that his values are transferred to the player through the coach. And that the coach is thinking, he's slow, he can't move, but he can do a job. He can get on his back and stay on his back. And if that's all he does, great. So he's got this fixed mindset about his player. And he communicates this implicitly or otherwise, and even through the words he speaks, just stick to the task, will you? Am I, it, would that have happened in our life, in your coaching career, would that have happened? Would you have been told just stick to the task? You probably would. But the growth mindset takes the exact same scenario and again transferring his or her values through their behavior, the coach thinks he does a great defensive job. The other coach thought he just stuck on his back but this coach feels he does a great defensive job because he limits the forward from doing what he should be doing. Let's build on this is his mindset. And he communicates this, he says you can change and improve. We will make you even better, but here's how we might try it, here's how we might do it, let's try it. So he sets in place strategies. He just doesn't has, he just doesn't have only a mindset of thinking, he actually does and produces a strategy. That's a key difference between the two coaches. And here's another interesting one that we saw. And I won't give you examples because you'll probably know who they are. 
but the growth mindset coach gathers around him people who are better than him at delivering what he needs delivered. The fixed mindset coach tends to gather people similar to him because he feels more comfortable in that environment. But at the end of the day, it's doing neither the fixed coach nor his players any benefit by having that attitude. But again, interestingly, what we're seeing is that that behavior is influenced by a deeper lying value system. Platitudes tend to be the order of the day with both sets of coaches. But the platitude for the growth-minded coach is usually in front of the media because he doesn't want to say too much. But with the fixed coach, it's in front of the media and in front of the players. And the old platitudes, we didn't have the ball. If we only had the ball, we might have been able to play. Give 110% effort in the motivational aspect. Now, when I was in school in Kappa White, 110% was a difficult concept. All I could do was 100% because that was my mindset. So this coach probably didn't go to school in Kappa White. The other platitude that we talk about is we must work harder. Well, what does that mean? The growth mindset will not just say we must work harder. There'll be a strategy for doing so. And the difference between the two should now become clear. Fault finding is the preoccupation of the fixed mindset coach. From what we saw when we observed, 90% of the coaches' interaction with players post-match was fault finding. Two weeks ago, I was at a growth mindset team. Now, I'm saying growth mindset. Please, they, they, they don't deal with those terms. This is just to categorize them, to help us understand what's going on when we lift the lid under there from, and, and look in. The growth mindset coach and the team, they're very successful at the moment. They're doing very well. The team talk afterwards to prepare for the next game was one where they highlighted everything that was done so well on the previous game. And it was a very close game, but they just won by the skin of their teeth. But they only highlighted what they did very well. On the basis that the players say, yes, I did that well, I did that well, very good. Reinforcing that, and then all they asked was, is there something you can do a little bit better? Very simple. A very simple mindset. Look, the reality is, and we know this from other studies, the players don't expect a coach to satisfy them, to be their friends, to be nice to them. They ask and request positive feedback, instruction, and individualized feedback. So that's what, that's what they require. They're, they're the core elements of what they require and seek from coaches. So, here's another interesting focus, again influenced by the mindset of the coach. Now, mindset, from mindset, read value system from now on. So when we talk about mindset, think about the value system that the coach holds, because that's what we're actually talking about. To, a crucial difference between the two types of coaches is that the actual growth coach manages the relationship between the player and the sport. And it's very clear, they, they celebrate when there's a win, but they empathize when, when there's a loss, and yet they see strategies that they can work on to help improve so that the chances of winning the next day are increased. But the fixed mindset just focuses on the game and the result. The win is the important thing. They celebrate too, by the way, but they like to blame. They tend to like to blame. Something went wrong. Something went wrong. Something didn't work. We didn't do this. If we'd done this, it would have worked. But again, those words reflect that mindset, that value system. Without doubt, there is a clear value of respect demonstrated by the growth coach. The growth coach the growth mindset coach displays it in the interactions constantly with players, with colleagues, with other stakeholders. Respect. We won't dwell on this because I'm going to move on now to this underpinning. One of the key differences again between the two, and this is the fifth difference, is 
growth over 80% of the coaches that we dealt with, 80% of those, when we looked at them in terms of what category they were in, acknowledged that they sought advice and that they deliberately completed CPD, continued professional development. Because they felt this was the, one of the key ways to go forward in terms of using strategies to help them when, they when, when a problem presented themselves. Whereas the fixed mindset coach said, no, we work it out ourselves. Now, working it out yourself tells you what? I ain't interested in any help or advice. Now, that can be a media face, and that's fine. But if that message is communicated within, inside in the changing room, or at home, well then, mm, it, that doesn't help. So, what are you, who are you? Do you can you recognize which side of the ooh, fixed or growth matrix continuum? Which side do you exist as a coach? Is winning the only thing that matters? Thankfully, there are few enough of those coaches here. Do you like change or don't you like change? Can you only see talent when you see players or do you see potential for growth? So these are all the simple issues that, and give away telltale signs. Look, my four coaching tip, and I won't dwell on it, is one that has worked marvelously well for us over the last few years. When I say for us, for a group that's involved in this, it's the no limits practice approach. We were always used to a scale of one to 10. Please rank how well you can kick the ball with your right foot out of 10. And some players would say, oh, that's my good foot, that's eight. <clears throat> And then rank how you can kick out off your left. Oh, that's not so good. That's six. Well, already from a growth mindset and from work that we've seen, that's putting a limitation on the development of not alone the poor foot or the relatively less effective foot, but also the good foot. A good colleague of mine, Dave Aldred, approaches everybody as follows. You start with 10 on the good one. Sorry, on the bad one. Start with 10 on the bad one. Where does I put the good one? Oh, 12. OK, go from there. So each week, he builds the number to keep going and going and going. He didn't set the limit at 10 for either of them. But implicitly, players do that, and we do that. OK, here's the real impact of what a growth-minded coach has. If I put the bar at 60%, as we would in any good exam, 60% means if you get 60%, you've done very well. So here's what it is. When the players were interviewed and spoken to and surveyed, who worked under a gross-minded coach, here was their response. They all gave, they all gave risk of injury, a 60% rate, physical performance development, a 60% rate, Fatigue management and practices, a 70 plus rating. Skill development, 70, 80 plus. And overall development as an individual, a very high mark of 85. In other words, the growth minded coach, from the player's perception and view, was really doing this very well. And those players, under the fixed coach's regime, didn't give such high scoring in any of those except for physical performance. When we look at the player's perception of how they were developing, and this is important and I'll explain this, with one of the staff, the strength and conditioning coach, working under either a fixed or a growth mindset approach, we saw the same thing. In other words, a growth coach impacts his staff significantly on the way they're affecting the player. So it's not just you alone are being affected and the players, it's all around you are being affected by the mindset that you have. Finally, and here is something that we're going to work on more, it translates into even something as basic as there's an increased injury risk, and we're compiling this data a lot more carefully now, there's an increased injury risk with having a fixed mindset. So players under the tutelage or governance of a fixed mindset coach are at increased risk of injury. This is preliminary findings from what we have. Now, 
that may have seemed as if we're talking about the performance end of the game. But no, it's more. It's, it's at all levels of the game. The mindset or the value system that's actually brought to the coaching arena is at all levels of the game. Here's a comment, and I think it's important, on the long-term development pathway for the players. Many years ago, we all embraced in sport the long-term modeling. Isfan Bali and his colleagues were very, very good, and they presented it in a very powerful way. Subsequently, we found out, however, that these models are flawed. They're flawed and they have very major issues that don't allow us to properly apply them. And the reason that they're flawed, and this is by no means a criticism of the individuals who purported them, is simply because they're one-dimensional mainly. The Bali model of long-term development, as you can see here, was mainly focused on a biological player. It was focused on maturation, physical and physical maturation. Other models have since taken uh, prominence and they've moved into other domains and other areas like psychology, developmental psychology, like performance psychology, like education and philosophy. So what has happened over the few years is that other models have come into being to help bring more, hol more of a holistic overview of a long-term model. And the better models now that we see in place around the world in sport are embracing a much wider value system and working on a much wider value system. Look, the 10,000 hour rule you're all very much aware of. This is one example of how the original model led us all astray. That purported that there was, ten, that there was this maxim or principle that you had to spend 10,000 hours or 10 years of deliberately practicing the skill to become expert. When in fact, one noted association of sport applied this a few years ago and decreed that every academy player from 8 to 18 had to have nearly three, nearly three hours deliberate practice a day in their program. Eventually they pulled it. Why? Because there was uproar, there was outrage, but there was the highest spike in injuries ever on the history of their injury surveillance system. And they got the message. We know, and there is evidence for it, for example, Brian O'Driscoll, who retired from international rugby, all of us would know, was one of our great rugby players. Brian had totaled a, a handsome total of 6,500 hours when he retired of deliberate practice. Oh, according to the theory, we shouldn't have let him retire. He had another 3,500 hours to go. But look, this is the danger in taking principles and systems without delving underneath and asking and asking, are we nurturing? Are we nurturing? And here's something very interesting that we found. And when you look at elite players, you often find that the longer they stay small, the greater they can be later. Why is that? Why is that? Lionel Messi stayed small for a long while. Look at some of the players that, we, that we've encountered and look at their growth rate. It's not necessary, and Fionn is going to talk later on about that relative age effect, a most powerful and challenging situation for you as coaches. But where the relative age effect is high, which it is, and Fionn will show you that, you have a challenge. You have a challenge now to refocus on nurturing the small, underdeveloped athlete a player. What does this lead to? This leads me to suggest that not only in our, in our own codes and sport, but in worldwide, there's a great need for a revision of not just the player pathway of development, but also the coach education pathway. There's a great need. Because we have seen, and it's only, if, 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 and it's only our evidence that I'm talking about, I'm, I'm, I'm just being probably very, very narrowed in this, but we've seen that the mindset and the value system that's applied impacts on injury rate, impacts on behavior, impacts on player nurturing and thriving, and whether they can thrive or not. And by the way, if it's a growth approach, there's a greater win ratio than here through four. I think we're fairly unique and privileged in that you have already a system that has been promoted and that is based on the values, the values of coaching. The values that exist in life 
that can be brought into the whole coaching process. And you have an amazing opportunity, I feel, from somebody that's outside and always looking in a little bit. I will be down in Bansha, West Tip, tomorrow at the county under 21 final and waiting with great interest to see if the combo can beat the Sarsfields. That's our combo. So I always I look in with great interest. I look in with great interest to see what other sports are doing. And when, I take, when we take the overall picture, this is something that's lacking worldwide. And you have an opportunity. You have an amazing opportunity to deliver on this. So to summarize, our coaching behavior as coaches and the way the athlete responds or the player is influenced by our mindset and value system. It clearly is. We, we've no doubt about this. The traits and practices of the growth coach, those who want players to thrive, suggest that this type of approach with the values attending to that impact positively not just on the way the players perform but on their development. As a consequence, the coaching pathway we feel does need does need revision. Finally, the tips, just in case you missed them as we were going through, here are the key five tips that I have to just maybe, maybe deliver. Know your player. Create an effective communication environment. Develop the creative side, and it can be developed. Practice maybe a little bit of no limits, and Get to know the underpinning values. The underpinning values are critical in all of this. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.